All right. Um, so before we begin, uh, let me just go over some some brief, um, just some brief general things. Uh, first off, um, if you haven't noticed yet, um, I made all four tests, uh, made copies of those, and and have it set up so you can do the old all of the old four tests as many times as you want. Um, I think this is a great place to really begin uh, reviewing um, for for the final exam to see, you know, what topics do you get, which topics don't you get, and the topics that you're still struggling with, uh, those will be the ones you want to focus on. So make sure that that you you try those out. Um, as a reminder, the final exam will be open starting tomorrow at midnight and closes, uh, or sorry, tomorrow at 12 a.m. and closes Friday at midnight. Um, so you have 48 hours to do it. So please make sure you do that and give yourself some time. Don't wait till the last minute in case technical difficulties happen. Um, that being said, I will not I will not be using ProctorU for this exam, which means it is open note. So make sure you are organized um, to use your notes as you see fit. Um, with that, everything in the grade book should be updated by now. So that should all be ready to go. So at this point, let me open it up to the floor. What questions do people have? Um, is there anything uh, you want me to go over more in depth, anything you still don't quite get, um, anything at all, uh, and I will answer them to the best of my abilities. Feel free, oops, feel free to um, either put them in chat or if you want to like, if you don't want to chat, if you want to actually say it, say it out loud, I can unmute you as well, but yeah, let me know. Uh, example how the trouble with the equations and example how to calculate polypeptide charges. Um, so let's go over those in order and hydropathy plot and indexes. Sure. Um, so the equations, I'm guessing it's probably the equations from test four. Um, and we can go over the problem in test four. So let me because that, the problem on test four, um, a lot of people seem to struggle with the, um, the, the kinetics of it. So let me share that. So share the screen here. So one of these problems was, um, so you have a cell that's at 37. If an enzyme in the cell makes three ionic bonds with a substrate that has an overall delta G of minus eight kilojoules per mole per muck per mole, what is the rate enhancement of that enzyme? All right. So the idea here is that we have it's one of these energy versus reaction coordinate plots, right? And the reaction without a without an enzyme looks like this. And then you have an enzyme that all an enzyme does is lower the activation barrier. And I'm saying that the overall change in delta G is minus eight kilojoules per mole. So we need to calculate, okay, how much faster um, will this enzyme go? And that is our rate enhancement equation, which is the exponent of the change in, change in delta G double dagger RT, right? Remember the gap between the substrate and the top 
that's delta G double dagger. So what an enzyme does is it lowers delta G double dagger, which we call delta delta G double dagger. So when we calculate this, we want to put in what is the change in uh, G double dagger, and that is eight kilojoules per mole divided by R. Well, R is 8.314 uh, joules per mole Kelvin. However, our change in delta G is in kilojoules. So our R needs to be in kilojoules. There are 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. So R would be times 10 to the minus three kilojoules. Basically, you just take R and you divide it by 1,000 to get kilojoules. 8.1314 times 10 to the minus three, that's our R. T was, uh, what did I say, 30 something? Uh, 37. So that's 273 plus 37, which is 310. And you put that all in and you should get, double check my math, that's where you should get that uh, 22.28. Eight divided, not multiplied. Yep, so that's how you calculate how much faster an enzyme will work. Uh, did I mention how many questions? I did not, um, and I forget. Let me, once I stop sharing my screen, I'll, I'll look at that again. Um, or once I get done with, with uh, the, the problems in test four, that would do math. I'll unshare my screen and take a look at that. Right, so that's how you do, that's how you use this equation. Um, the tricky thing is this number should be a positive number because if you leave it as minus eight, your rate enhancement is like 0. 0.0001, which is saying you're going like a thousand times slower, right? So make sure you get a number greater than one when you're doing rate enhancement or you're saying that the enzyme slows down. Um, so that was one equation. What was the other equation on here? Ah, an enzyme has a maximum velocity of 3.7 meters per, or meters, molarity per second. So Vmax equals 3.75. If I run an experiment with initial velocity, so V initial, equals 0 0.85 and my substrate concentration is 0.34. So substrate equals 0.34 molar, molar per second. And my enzyme total, E total is 0 0.50 molar. What's Km? What is Kcat? And what's catalytic efficiency? So again, if we go back to our equation sheet that I gave you on for test four, um, we'll see we have all the equations we need to solve this. So first, let's go with the Michaelis-Menten equation, which is our, our normal enzyme kinetics equation. What this says is that our initial velocity is equal to our maximum velocity multiplied by our concentration of substrate divided by our Michaelis constant plus our concentration of substrate. So you can see, I guess I should put a zero, an O of seven I, I forget that it is velocity initial. Um, you can see that we have a initial velocity of V max and a substrate concentration. So we have one equation and one unknown variable. We can use that to solve Km. So let's put in our numbers here. Our initial velocity is 0 0.085. Our V max was 3.75. Our substrate was 0.34. And our Km is our unknown plus our substrate concentration, 0.34. We're going to want to solve for Km. 
So I'm going to just simply move the denominator to the other side of the equation by multiplying each side by Km plus 0.34. So 0 0.85 Km plus 0.34 is equal to, let me multiply the numerator together. So that's 3.75 times uh, 0.34. Okay, 3.75 times 0.34. So our numerator is 1.275. I want to get Km alone, so divide each side by 0.85. This says that um, Km plus 0.34 equals 1.5. Subtract each side by 0.34. And Km is 1.16. So that's how we can use the Michaelis-Menten equation to get Km if we're given everything else. Then we have um, I have to move my sheet. What's the next thing I'm asking for here? Then we have uh, KCAT and we have catalytic efficiency. So KCAT, that, that should be, um, do I have it on your equation sheet? Emails. Um, I do. Let me just double check that I did everything right. 3.75 divided by enzyme total. Yep. So um, KCAT is if you if you have the test for equation sheet open, it's the one right after initial velocity. KCAT equals V max divided by enzyme total. Well, our V max is 3.75 and our E total is 0.5. That's how we get 7.5. And catalytic efficiency is our third equation on that equation sheet, which says that catalytic efficiency equals K cat divided by Km or 7.5 divided by 6.5. Um, so yeah, those were the uh, uh, equations um, that we saw in chapter, or test four. Um, and you might see them again on the final. So make sure you, you know, if you didn't quite understand how to do that, make sure you spend a little bit of time um, and familiarize yourself with those equations. What do the variables mean and all that good stuff? Um, let me get, let me tell you how many questions are going to be on the final that I'll get to the other questions that were posted on chat. Right now you're looking at roughly 90 questions and it looks like, yep. So 90 questions, but every question's multiple choice or multiple answer. So hopefully that should be plenty of time in two and a half hours. Um, typically the rule of thumb is um, if, if you know something on a multiple choice, it shouldn't take you more than a minute to figure it out. So hopefully that will give you time to think about the ones that you're not quite sure on. Um, but yeah, 90-ish questions, uh, two and a half hours for that. Let's take a look at our other questions. Uh, examples of how to calculate polypeptide charges. No problem. So let me share a whiteboard. All right, so 
These questions, I only ask you to calculate the charge at TH1, 7, and 14 because to make it easy for you. So if you see this question on the exam, it will be calculate the pH at, or calculate the charge at a pH of 1, 7, and 14. Um, so let's do the... Um, Let's do the amino acid K E R A. Each amino acid has an N terminus and C terminus. And the first thing that we should really do is uh, figure out the pKa of all of these groups. Um, so the pKa of an N terminus we're always going to say that pK of an N terminus is roughly nine. We're always going to say the C terminus has a pK of roughly two. Um, in reality, the termini have different pKs depending on what amino acid it's attached to, um, but we're not going to really worry about that. So we have the pK of lysine, which I believe is 10.5. Uh, glutamic acid is 4.25. Um, arginine is like 12 and a half, something like that. Uh, alanine does not have a pKa. Right. So I think the easiest way to start this is always at a pH of seven, because when I had you memorize the amino acids long, long ago, a couple months ago now, we always learn the amino acids at a pH of seven. That is what charge are they? Because the majority of the time when we talk about amino acids, it's inside the cell and the cells uh, pH is like 7.2. So that's why we learn them at roughly seven. So at a pH of seven, the end term nine is positively charged. And we have, um, positively and negatively charged amino acids. Negative at seven would be D and E, positive are R, K, and H. For this exercise, we're gonna say H is charged at seven, but in reality, at a pH of seven, 30% H's might be positively charged, the other 70% will be neutral. So it's, it's it's a just a it's a fraction of histamine is being charged. Anyways, the end terminus is positively charged. Um, lysine is positively charged. Glutamic acid is negatively charged. Arginine is positively charged. Alanine has no charge. The C terminus is negatively charged at pH of seven. So from there, we just add up all the charges. So I have three positive charges, two negative charges. Overall, at a pH of seven, this peptide has a, a formal charge of plus one. So let's go to the pH of one. And there's a couple of tricks to do this. Um, this is probably the easiest one to remember in a short amount of time. At a pH of one, you have a lot of protons in solution, a lot. What that means is that anything that was negatively charged at a pH of seven becomes neutral in this environment because they get a proton put on them. Anything that's neutral or positively charged stays that way at low pHs. So N terminus, still positively charged. K, positively charged. Glutamic acid was negative at seven and it becomes neutral. Arginine, positively charged, stays that way. Alanine, neutral, will stay that way. C terminus, negatively charged. So that becomes neutral. So at a pH of one, our peptide has a plus three charge. At a pH of 14, you are in conditions of low hydrogen. What that means is that anything that was positively charged 
becomes neutral. So I guess at uh, pH one, I should say negative goes to neutral. At a pH of 14, positive goes to neutral. And a couple special amino acids, tyrosine and serine become negatively charged because they have PKAs of like 10. So they, they actually lose a proton at, at high pHs. Everything else remains the same. Anything that's neutral at seven other than these two amino acids will remain neutral. Anything that's negative at a pH of seven will remain negative. So anything that's positive at a pH of seven uh, goes neutral. So N-terminus positive at seven, neutral. Lysine, positive at seven, neutral. Glutamic acid, negative at seven, doesn't change. Arginine, positive at seven, neutral. Alanine, neutral, doesn't change. C-terminus, negative at seven, stays negative. So our overall charge at a pH of 14 is minus two. So following that type of logic, you can figure out the formal charge at, for any peptide at those three extremes, one, seven, and 14. If, if you try to figure out charges of polypeptides at different pHs, that's not one, seven, or 14, you have to do more complicated math. But if I'm just asking you those three, which I will, it's as simple as I've pointed out right there. Okay. Hydropathy uh, plots and in indexes. All right. So hydrophobicity plots. Um, so for hydrophobicity plots, it's a graph that looks like this. Positive values up here, negative values down here. And what a hydrophobicity plot tells you is based on the primary sequence, um, are you likely to be in the membrane or not? So if you're studying a membrane protein and you don't know what it looks like, uh, one of the things you can do is get its um, mRNA sequence to figure out its primary sequence. And from there you can plot you know, how many membrane helixes are there? Um, so let me just 100% double check that I'm gonna say this right, because I think I have the positive and negative correct in my head. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't hurt to double check. Yep, I do. All right, so positive numbers are hydrophobic amino acids. Negative numbers are hydrophilic. And this, this kind of plot, it's really an average where let's say I had like 10 amino acids What you do is that um, base, basically every amino acid has a score, right? Hydrophobic amino acids have a positive score, a numerical value. Uh, hydro, hydrophilic amino acids have a negative score. And you just look at like neighbors. So here I'm grouping them by three. So you look at the first three amino acids and you get a score and you plot that. You look at the next three amino acids, you get a score, you plot that, so on and so forth. And from there, you can tell, you know, where in the membrane your protein is going to be. The way I asked this on the test is, um, you know, I gave you two hydrophobicity plots and I said, you know, which one is a, a most likely to be a transmembrane protein? And it's the one that looks like this. something like that. 
Um, because what this is saying, when you see something that goes up and down like this, like these high scores going up, that means you have a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids in a row. And then when it goes down, you are getting to hydrophilic. So let me draw this in the membrane. So, so right now I'm drawing, let me see, one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to draw the actual protein that would go along with this. All right. So I have one, two, three, four, five little humps to go with one, two, three, four, five tri uh, transmembrane helices. The helices are all hydrophobic. That's why they get high positive scores. Then when you go outside the membrane, you're surrounded by water. So these are hydrophilic amino acids and your score goes down. And one thing to note, your score doesn't have to be negative. Just because you're in the positive region doesn't mean that like you're looking at hydrophobic amino acids. Because remember, it's like an average. You want to look at the slope of the line. Is the line going up? That means you have more and more hydrophobic amino acids. Is the slope going down? That means you have more and more hydrophilic amino acids, right? So that's hydrophobic. And this is hydrophilic. So you really want to look at the slope of these curves to determine, am I looking at hydrophobic amino acids or am I looking at hydrophilic amino acids? So that's our hydrophobicity plot. Uh, could we review sugars, non-reducing, alpha linkages, all that good stuff? Sure. I think for this one, it might be easier to pull up uh, the slide instead of me doing some drawings. Actually, I'll just draw, that's fine. Let's clear this. All right, so sugar naming. So let me do a sugar here. Uh, o -H -H. Sure. All right, the first thing we need to determine when naming sugars is to find the anomeric carbon, anomeric carbon. And the anomeric carbon will always be, co be connected to the oxygen in the ring and it will have an OH. So it's a carbon with two oxygens connected. Um, and one of those oxygens will always be in the ring. So that's the first thing we need to do to be able to name things. Now, once we do that, the next thing we need to figure out is this alpha or beta. And to do that, we have to compare with the CH2OH group over here. Now, if the OH and the CH2OH, if they're going in the same direction, like they're both pointing up or they're both pointing down, that's called beta. You're in the beta conformation. If on the other hand, let me draw an alpha here. If the CH2OH and the OH are pointing in opposite directions, we call that an alpha sugar. All right, so that's the difference between beta and alpha. Now let's look at a disaccharide. So 
I'm going to take this OH and I'm going to connect it to a, another sugar. Uh, um, actually, let me point that one there. All right, so naming disaccharide linkages. So first, we start with the left sugar and we name um, we name the linkage of the, the uh, glycosidic bond. So basically I'm, I'm telling you where the glycosidic bond is. And you can see it's on our anomeric carbon. If your glycosidic bond uh, is on your anomeric carbon, you have to tell me, is your anomeric carbon alpha or beta? For this circle, CH2OH is going up the glycosidic bond is going down. So these are opposite directions. So this, this carbon is in alpha. So this is alpha one, because this is carbon number one. So to do the naming schemes on a six membered ring, uh, carbon one is your anomeric carbon. Then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. So alpha one. So carbon one in the alpha position. Then I have to say the linkage of my, uh, or I have the name, the other carbon, a part of my glycosidic bond. And this other carbon is also an anomeric carbon. So now we have to name this anomeric carbon. Is this alpha or beta? Well, our glycosidic bond is pointing down here and our CH2OH is also pointing down. So both of these are pointing in the same direction. So this is beta. This is also a six membered ring. So our anomeric carbon is number one. So this is an alpha one, beta one glycosidic bond. And this is non-reducing. A non-reducing disaccharide is when both anomeric carbons are in a glyc glycosidic bond. So both anomeric carbons are in a glycosidic bond. Now let's do one, uh, another one. H2, OH. I drew that a little bad. Sorry. Um, let's do it like this. Yeah. So let's name this link with linkage. Our glycosidic bond on our carbon to the left is on carbon one, two. So this is a two linkage. Note, if your anomeric carbon is not in a glycosidic bond, is not part of that bond, you don't say alpha or beta, right? Because what we're doing is we're naming that glycosidic bond. And alpha and beta only refers to the anomeric carbon. So if it's if the glycosidic bond is not part of or if the anomeric carbon is not part of the glycosidic bond, do not put alpha or beta. It is wrong if you do that. So first, that carbon there is carbon number two. So this is a two. And then we have to name the other bond. So one, two, three. Actually, yeah, we'll do that. I, I messed up drawing this, but it'll work. One, two, three. Two, three. So this is a two, three bond, right? None of my anomeric carbons are in the bond. So I never say alpha and beta. Since I, since um, both my anomeric carbons are not in a glycosidic bond, this is reducing, right? So hopefully 
those two examples tell you like the, the naming scheme. So a uh, very quick refresher, use alpha and beta only if, you, only if it's your anomeric carbon. Alpha, OH, CH2OH, opposite, beta, both directions. Non-reducing, both anomeric carbons in a bond, reducing, they're both not in a bond. Note that that would also be reducing if I did something like that, because I still have a free anomeric carbon there. All right, uh, question 12 on test one. All right, um, so for those, um, could you tell me what the question is? Because um, everybody gets their questions in different order. Um, so what for you, what was your question 12? Then, then I can go over that. And all I need is like part of the question that I can do uh, control F and find it. Uh, chain terminator sequence, sure. So let me stop sharing this. Ah, okay. Well, let me just make sure. So let me share this again. So in the chain terminator sequence methods, what is the purpose of DDNTPs? Um, so first, let's let's define our terms. So an NTP is a nucleotide triphosphate. A DNTP is DNA. Right, so if there's just an H at the two prime position, that's a DNTP. So it has an OH there and phosphate sticking out there. So this is a DNTP. A DDNTP is missing the three prime hydroxyl two, as well as the two prime. So this is a DDNTP, All right? So what the chain terminator sequence method is, it's a way to um, sequence DNA. It's an old fashioned way, but it's really good on like short nucleotide sequences. So it's still used today. The idea is, is that these DDNTPs are fluorescent. They're fluorescent and they stop any DNA strand from being made any further. Because to add nucleotides to DNA, you need a three prime hydroxyl, right? You need a OH at the three prime position or you cannot add nucleotides to it. So the idea here is let's say I'm trying to sequence the uh, AGTC. Right, so I have a, a piece of DNA. I don't know the sequence, but I'm gonna tell you the sequence is AGTC. The way that this would work is that you would use the chain terminator sequence like maybe 10,000 times, right? You'd run this experiment a lot. And what would happen is that sometimes you'll have DDG uh, added and this will be fluorescent and nothing can be added after it. So you know your first nucleotide is a C because you have a G there. Other runs, you would get GTP, then DD um, ATP added. Once you have a DD um, amino acid or non-amino acid nucleotide, you can't add after it. So in run one, right, for example, you know, oh, okay, my first nucleotide must be a G, or sorry, a C, because DDGTP was able to bind. And run two, normal GTP was added, and then DDATP was added, which means, okay, my second nucleotide must be a T, right? So run three, 
Well, DGTP is added, DATP. Then if DTCTP is added, you know, oh, my third nucleotide is a G. Um, so that's what you do, right? You have a sample of DNA, a lot of copies of your DNA. You have both DNTPs plus DDNTPs. And these DDNTPs are just added at random and they stop elongation and they're fluorescent. So you're able to read them. And by doing enough of these experiments, you're gonna get a stop at every single position with a DDNTP eventually that you can just read the sequence through that fluorescence. So that's, that's how DDNTPs work in the chain terminator sequence. Uh, intracellular concentrations and hyper hypo. Sure. Um. All right. So let's go over intracellular concentrations here. So I have a red blood cell. That's 100 millimolar NaCl. On the outside, I have 200 millimolar MgF2. What is this? You are in a hypertonic solution. So Iso, iso means same. So if the concentration of salt in your cell and the solution are the same, that's called an isotonic solution. And there's really no net movement of water. If the concentration of salt in your cell is greater than your solution. Um, this is called hypotonic, right? So if your cell was 200 and your solution was 100, um, and what would happen here is that water will move into your cell. And your cell would like burst while in the situation we have, if the solution has a higher salt concentration in your cell, that's hypertonic and water will move out of the cell. Let's move out of the cell. And your cell will shrink. Note that it we don't care about the salts. Um, this is a property that we don't actually care about like, you know, what salt it is. We just care about the concentration, right? So um, that's why, you know, four is wrong. We just care about concentration of salt, not what the salt actually is. Um, on test one, there was a question asking about temperature. If a reaction was spontaneous, if the enthalpy is 676 and the entropy is 10.4. Um, okay. So this is a question that like, um, let me clear this stuff. Uh, everybody got random variables for, so since you put the numbers in, let me use your numbers. Um, so the enthalpy, um, is 676 and the entropy is 10.04. And the question is, what temperature is this spontaneous at? So what this is testing you on is, first off, um, do you know how enthalpy and entropy relate to um, if a process is spontaneous? And the way they do that is through our Gibbs equation. Our free energy equation is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. 
while enthalpy is uh, delta H, entropy is delta S. And you're spontaneous when you're negative, right? So the way to really solve this question is you set delta G to zero and you want to figure out, okay, if delta G is zero, then I know the temperature like where it's not spontaneous or spontaneous. And so anything, um, well, it depends on your signs of T, H, and S, but that will tell you if something's spontaneous or not. So let me just work through it, then I'll explain it. Um, so our H is 676 minus T, that's what we're trying to figure out, 10.04, right? So subtract each side by 676 equals negative T times 10.04. Uh, divide each side by negative 10.04. So let me do that. which is 67.4. And what this says is that any temperature higher than 67.4 would be spontaneous. So the computer said like, um, it was looking for an answer of 67 plus or minus one so like if you put in like 68, that would be fine. Um, but it was just basically asking you to uh, connect all those ideas together of enthalpy, entropy, free energy. What does it mean to be spontaneous or not? I mean, if you wanted to, you could also put in like a set of solving for zero. You could be like, I'm gonna solve for negative 0.01. That you'll get basically the same answer and that will be true. Uh, test one, what does the term salting out mean? Um, salting out is a way to purify proteins. Um, so let's say you have three proteins, A, B, and C. So you opened up a cell and you want to study a protein. Let's say you want to study protein B. And let's say that protein A is soluble in 50 millimeters of salt B is 75 and C is 100. So salting out is basically using salt to purify B away from the other two proteins. So what you would do in the experiment is you would add like 74 millimolars of salt to your solution. And your solution has all three of these proteins in it what would happen is that B and C would be soluble because they are soluble up to these concentrations. A forms a solid. So A would crash out of solution because it is not soluble at 74 millimolar of salt. And so you take the supernatant or the liquid and you do this experiment again. But this time you go up to maybe like 76 millimolar of NaCl. C then would be soluble. B would form a solid. And so what you would do is that you would take your solid, remove the liquid from it. So you'd get rid of C, take your solid and then re-add like um, buffer to lower the salt concentration so that your B would go back in the solution. And now you have a solution that only has protein B in it. That is salting out. I have that answer. Oh, okay. I never put the answer to that. Um, but yeah, that, that is um, what salting out is using salt to purify your protein um, 
and it's basically the steps I listed there. What else? Got time for a few more questions if people have them. Calculate inhibition constants question two out of PowerPoint. All right. Share that. Stop share and then share. So this is the PowerPoint, uh, the last one we went over. Um, so let's let's get to calculating the uh, inhibition constant. And I believe this was mixed um, because the uh, Vmax is low and Km doesn't change. So I want to calculate um, the, the inhibition constant for this. And our inhibition constants are Ki, right? Ki or Ki prime. And Ki, that goes with um, Km. Ki prime is Vmax. So if you're... Um, Basically, yeah, the, the prime goes with Vmax, the, the non-prime goes with Km. So when competitive, you're calculating an alpha. Uncompetitive, you're calculating an alpha prime. Um, and then with mixed, it depends. Depends on if Vmax and Km are changing. Um, for this, this problem, I'm saying Km's unchanged. So alpha um, is not a factor. Um, we don't care about alpha. We care about alpha prime here uh, because the Vmax is changing. So let's figure this out. Alpha prime equals one plus the inhibition constant divided by Ki. I. So the the amount of inhibitor was given in the problem. I have five nanomolars of this. Ki or Ki prime is what we're trying to solve. So that's an unknown. And so we need alpha prime. And what alpha prime is, it's basically how well um, you're, you're working as inhibitor. So I believe that's, we got that from um, the, the previous, uh, one of these previous problems where it's like, okay, what proportion of the enzyme have uh, uh, a molecule bound? Let me just pull up my notes to 100% make sure. Okay. 100% make sure I'm not gonna tell you the wrong thing going off the top of my head. There we are. All right. 
So I'm gonna actually stop sharing this one. And I'm gonna share the one with my notes on it. That already has it solved. All right, so we want to figure out what alpha prime is. And we get it from this equation, V max apparent equals V max divided by alpha prime. So what V max apparent is, is V max of in, when you have inhibitor. So when I have my inhibitor present, what is my maximum speed? And so here we're saying our Vmax is 80% of our normal value. So let's just say my normal Vmax is one molar per second. We can say whatever value we want is normal, as long as we say 80% is inhibitor. So 80% of one is pointing. So my Vmax apparent, we're gonna say is pointing. So with that, and here I did 180, it, it doesn't matter as long as, as we are consistent. So what I did from this equation on the left to this equation on the right, is I just switched Vmax apparent and alpha prime. So I can solve for alpha prime itself, Put in values of Vmax and Vmax apparent as long as they're um, as long as Vmax apparent's 80% of Vmax, you will always get 1.25. So our alpha prime value is 1.25. Um, alpha should always be above one. The bigger the value of alpha, the more it inhibits. So once we have that, we can solve for Ki from this equation down here. Alpha prime is 1.25 equals one plus the amount inhibitor given up here divided by Ki. Ki is 20 nanomole. So what that basically says is that um, if you had 20 nanomolar of inhibitor, um, you're going more or less inhibit half of your enzyme. So that's that's our inhibition constant and how to solve it. It's a, it's, it's a little bit complex with the amount of what you have to do for this. Um, but yeah, that, that's how you do it. Which of these is a glycerol phospholipid? So I'm gonna move to test three. So let me pull up the PowerPoint for that. Maybe that will help. All right, so the question is on test three, which one of these is a glycerol phospholipid? So let's go back to our definition of glycerol phospholipid. And a glycerol phospholipid is fatty acid, fatty acid, phosphate, something else, right? Um, so it's glycerol three phosphate. So you have your glycerol backbone, two fatty acids and a phosphate. So that's what we're looking for. So let's go to the test to look at that exact question now. So, we're looking for fatty acid, fatty acid, phosphate, whatever. Um, Rs just mean um, a group of like for glycerol, like a bunch of carbons. So fatty acid, fatty acid, phosphate, something else. Yeah, that looks good. This is not a fatty acid. So that's no good. That's not a fatty acid. So that's no good. Those aren't fatty acids, so that's no good. So that A is your glycerol phospholipid. Try 
structural binding. Oh, hemoglobin has cooperativity. Please describe structurally how the binding of one oxygen in one subunit can influence the binding of oxygen in other subunits. Sure. So this, this question here is just trying to ask, do you know what happens on a molecular level when oxygen binds? So let's go back to our description or let's, let's think about heme, all right? So remember that hemoglobin has four hemes. So heme one, heme two, heme three, heme four. Um, and it's basically four proteins as one protein, right? So it has four peptide chains that make up one protein. And where these proteins are, interact, uh, they can talk to each other. So um, protein one can, can talk to protein two and protein three. Protein three can talk to one and four, right? So what happens is that you have um, iron and this is in, so this is uh, iron and this is in the heme. Right, it's surrounded by like heme. And you have a histidine at the top and you have a histidine at the bottom. When oxygen binds, uh, the iron is pulled towards the oxygen. When the iron is pulled towards the oxygen, the distal histidine is pulled as well. This is connected to, I believe, off the top of my head, it's called the S helix. And that's just like the name of the helix. The F helix or the F barrel, that moves as well. So oxygen binds, you have this whole protein like shifting to go towards it because the iron moved towards the oxygen. This histidine is connected to the iron and this histidine is connected to the rest of the protein. So you have a big shift. When this shift happens, um, the overlap here changes. So you have a few amino acids that go through a structural change at where I drew these circles, which indicates to these other proteins, oh, oxygen is bound at one heme we're going to make it more favorable to bind oxygen ourselves. So we're going to preemptively move our irons down into the heme. So it makes um, oxygen easier to bind to us. That is what I was talking about structurally. Can you describe on an amino acid basis basically what happens when iron, uh, oxygen is binding? So that's kind of what I was looking for there. All right, so it is a little past four and my throat is starting to get a little dry. Um, so uh, I will say, if you have other questions while going through, don't hesitate to email me and I will answer them uh, to the best of my abilities. Um, if you want to have a meeting to go over a lot of questions, we can do that too. Are all the questions from the test, uh, as in copy and paste, no. Um, but um, the topics will be similar, right? So if there was a question that you didn't get on the test, make sure you brush up on that topic, like you understand that topic. Um, so that's how they will be similar. But for the most part, I won't like copy and paste questions. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, let me know if you have questions. Um, let me know if you have a meeting. Um, yeah, no problem. It's a job I enjoy doing. Wish I could be there in person because talking to a, a classroom of one was not, not the best experience, but I'm sure learning online is not the best experience for people either. So um, hopefully by the fall, if you're still around, things will be somewhat back normal. Um, otherwise, 
Um, thank you for coming. Um, let me know if you have any issues. Uh, remember, Thursday, Friday, please, please don't wait till the last minute. Otherwise, have a good summer. <laughs>